So hello and a very warm welcome from me to another fabulous event brought to you to, by the one and only Cycle Touring Festival. I'm Kate Rawls, I'm a touring cyclist, I guess, and also a writer. And I'm particularly interested in what I've come to think of as Adventure Plus, the kind of cycle touring that combines a journey by bike with something else. In my case, that something else has been an attempt to use long bike rides to help raise awareness and inspire action on some of our most urgent environmental challenges, climate change and biodiversity loss. In Julian's case, the something else is an exploration of various social and political issues. He cycled literally all around the world. He's an award-winning author, and he is, in my view, an exemplar of the Adventure Plus approach. So the book we're gonna be mostly chatting about today is his fifth book, fifth book, 50 Miles Wide, Cycling in Israel and Palestine. But we thought we'd start with his very first book, which is called Life Cycles. As you probably know, back in 2009, Julian took a wee break from his work as a cycle courier in London in order to have a crack at the record for cycling around the world. The resulting book, Life Cycles, has been described as on the road for the occupied generation, an adventure and a quest with a political heart. Julian, huge welcome. It's wonderful to be sort of here with you. Maybe you could start by reminding us of the backstory to that round the world attempt. What was it that really fired you up? Because I know you were really fired up to want to do it. What, what was that all about? Yeah, I mean, um, thanks for having me and inviting me in the introduction, Kate. Very kind, very flattering. Um, yeah, it's funny that the around the world was now 10 years going back and it's kind of, um, you know, it's gone pretty quick. But uh, in short, um, I'm, I'm half Turkish. I'd cycled a few times from the UK to Istanbul. Um, had, you know, as many cycle, cycling tourists will relate that amazing experience of life on the road, um, you know, where you're just riding kind of uh, out of the sunset and into small villages and people are sort of showing you great hospitality and um, you know just the world as it feels it could be and should be um, and then there was a, a very kind of big money corporate world record attempt at, uh, at a circumnavigation of 18,000 miles and it was sponsored by banks and investment funds um, and you know I was a politics graduate as well um, and so this kind of, you know, this contrast of um, the sort of humility and the humble, humble life on the road, um, as compared with this big money, hell and back adventure, uh, I just found something a little bit offensive around that kind of, uh, you know, very alpha male representation of adventurous suffering and sort of conquering the world rather than, you know, sort of discovery and, you know, sharing experiences, learning about cultures. Um, and, and yeah, actually the, the speed at which it had been set wasn't particularly fast. It was sort of uh, 90 miles a day average. I'd probably done 70 miles a day average cycling from the UK to Istanbul. So I thought, you know, maybe I can have a go at this. Um, so I did and set out and, and broke the record with 18,000 miles in, I think it's 169 days, um, you know, to sort of reclaim this kind of spirit of life on the road and, and the adventure of, um, of that and, and the spirit of the bicycle, which I've always found to be such a sort of humble and, and like heartwarming in, in road into the world and a way of meeting people. It's a, you know, it's a great leveller. Um, there's something very non-ostentatious about arriving in a small place, especially in poorer countries, on a bicycle rather than showing up in a, in a motor car or having your entourage or whatever it might be. Um, so, yeah, I did that. And, um, yeah, as you say, the whole kind of combination of, of cycling and, and politics has uh, it's always been, you know, integral to what I've done. And, and then the recent book with Palestine and Israel. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it was kind of really sort of testing the, the theory to a, you know, to a greater degree, even when you have a place that, um, you know, I, I'd kind of accidentally cycled in, in conflict areas before in, in Uyghur in Northwest China or on the US Mexico border with lots of trafficking concerns and, you know, paramilitaries or whatever it might be. But I'd never actually gone to a place that was sort of you know sadly known for conflict which palestine doesn't need to be you know there are just guys in palestine and in israel who just enjoy cycling and, and there is that side to it it's a beautiful place to ride there is a great bike culture both in palestine and and in israel 
Um, so yeah, it was wanting to see this, this you know, beautiful geography, um, meeting people and talking to people and, and, you know, the sort of humanity and that kind of shared community yeah. of the bicycle, really trying to sort of um, you, use that as a way of starting conversations and, and having a, a slightly different experience on, on this area. So, yeah, I, I mean, nevertheless, there are some, as well as the continuity, there are some quite significant shifts, aren't there, between the first book and this current one. I mean, in 50 miles wide, there's much less beasting the big miles and there's much more kind of hanging out with people and drinking coffee. And also the, the political focus is, is very, very different. What was that like to be no longer trying to race, but to, but to really slow down and really be in a place? Did you have to make it, did you have to work at that or did that kind of come naturally by this stage? I mean, I guess across the last 10 years, it comes more and more naturally. And, <laughs> and I can only imagine how naturally it might come 10 more years down the line. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, the, the circumnavigation, I, I actually still just about managed to have a lot of fun, even doing 110 miles a day on average. Um, but even with that, you know, there were experiences that I know that I missed out on because I, I had to press on. Um, you know, and, and as I say, I'm half Turkish and the ride to Istanbul is one that I must have done about seven times. Mm. Uh, and I love that ride by various different routes that I've taken. Um, so occasionally I think about, you know, the transcontinental race, which, you know, the participants generally knock out within a fortnight. And I just, yeah, the, the, the lure of the cafe and the restaurant um, and my notepad and conversation. Yeah, yeah. I mean, this is, you know, this is the heart of what cycle touring evermore has become about for me. So, yeah, I'm not sure. Uh, it, it's not such an effort to, to resist sitting in a cafe having a conversation, I've got to say. Yeah. Although I'm beginning to, to think the, the more rides I do, the more I, I always find myself in a race to the finish at the end and having to race past things. And I think the only way to get out of that is either not to have a finish point or not to have a time deadline um, or maybe even ideally both. And one of my fantasies one day is just to cycle out of the door with no plan and, <laughs> and only the notebook and only the coffee branches. Anyway, let's come back to um, 50 miles wide. Let's let's have a look at where we are. I mean, here's a map that we prepared earlier that may or may not work. But maybe when when and if I get the map up, you could talk us through where we are in the world and then where you went within Israel and Palestine. Can you see the map? Not coming yet, but I'm waiting for it. I okay. have opened the map here. I think yes. it's Yes, I suspect you might also be able to see some clutter around the map, but ignore that and just focus on the map. So here we are, Israel and Palestine. Locate that in the wider world and then talk us through where you cycled. Yeah, so I mean, Palestine really is the heart of the Middle East um, geographically. You know, it's right on the edge of the Mediterranean. Um, you've got Turkey just to the, the northwest, Lebanon to the north, Syria, Jordan. Um, round to the, the east coast and then Egypt uh, and the Red Sea, Egypt to the west and Red Sea to the south. Um, and you've got Jerusalem right in the middle, which of course on a religious level is very central to the regions. Uh, you know, it has the old city at the heart of it, which actually sits inside East Jerusalem, which is recognized Palestinian um, capital of a, of a future Palestinian state. Uh, Israel is, is in a quite concerted uh, effort. I mean, particularly actually using the sport of cycling and with the Giro d'Italia starting mm -hmm. in Jerusalem a few years ago, um, you know, is presenting it as a single unified Israeli city. And obviously with the United States moving their embassy to Jerusalem, um, where, whereas all major countries keep their embassies in Tel Aviv in recognition of the fact that Jerusalem's divided. So yeah, you have Jerusalem in the center of it, which has such religious significance. I would have flown into Tel Aviv, uh, Jaffa, uh, the old Palestinian port there. And um, yeah, I kind of ended up doing a sort of, the, the main route and the ride described in 50 miles wide is a, uh, it's a sort of figure of eight really of, of going into the West Bank, which is kind of, you know, in 1948, essentially, this all of this space was Palestine. Um, Israel, Israeli settlers, Jewish settlers had been moving to the region for a long time, but in earlier times, kind of more religiously motivated settlers. 
Um, and then obviously in the aftermath of the Holocaust and events in Europe in the mid 1940s, you had a, an absolute, um, you know, a, a surge of, of Jewish migrants and settlers to, the, to Palestine. Um, and then in 1948, that culminated with, with the, the state of Israel um, being, being formed. Um, that was on the back of the 1917 Balfour Declaration as well. And, and both the 1948 founding of Israel and the Balfour Declaration had really talked about two states, a state for Israel and a state of Palestine. Um, and, and it had recognized Palestine as and, and the Palestinian population as being kind of indigenous to these lands, um, which is kind of an element that, you know, in, increasingly with very sort of effective propaganda and, and PR methods is, is kind of getting excluded from the reality. But yeah, th this map here, which is kind of a, a fairly common one, um, you, you know, you see Gaza down there and by the by the Mediterranean coast, and then you see the West Bank, and they're, they're kind of, you know, there's a lot of ghettoization of the Palestinian communities there. I mean, you know, places like Ramallah, or Nablus or Jericho might be small cities or th lovely thriving little towns even, but then a, a lot of the Palestinian settlements are essentially kind of refugee, refugee camps because the, the surge of Jewish refugees out of Europe essentially after the Holocaust meeting with um, settler movements that were already established in, in Israel, in Palestine, many of which were armed and with lots of militia violence and, and Palestinians losing their homes to it. And so, I mean, often it gets forgotten that the Palestinians are essentially probably the world's oldest refugee population. Um, mm. It was 70 years waiting for a statehood that was promised to them or more recently waiting on a um, you know, a proper integration into a, a single unified state where everyone has a vote, Palestinians and Israeli Jews alike, and, and Israeli Palestinian Arabs also. So the, the kind of um, lines on the map, as, as they often do, really kind of illustrate both, uh, you know, the political complexity mm -hmm. that, that has been set up, in a in a situation that really should not be as complex as it has been made i mean a lot of the complexities that i, I therefore try not to bow to a lot of the complexities are, are arising from a, essentially a denial of palestinian rights the denial of palestinians to move in their own land the sort of issue of say reparations or compensation for palestinians who lost their houses to jewish settlers in the 1940s in places like haifa in jaffa and tel aviv um, and, and ongoing in East Jerusalem, where there's a lot of violence and, and particularly very religiously motivated sort of Jewish settler violence, because there's a the desire to, to claim Jerusalem um, as the, you know, as the homeland of and the, the central heart of an Israeli state. I mean, the religious dimension also has an extra element because you have the very right wing evangelical Christians in the United States. Who see who you know prophecy for them is that the Jews must be in Israel and must be in Jerusalem for the coming of the Christ. So then you get this right wing Christian movement that also sort of throws into the Malay somewhat. And uh, it, you know it, it's risky to overstate religion because actually every Palestinian that I've ever met or spoken to really you know, wanted to go for a bike ride without being stopped at military checkpoints. Um, you know, I was recently on a webinar with a Palestinian cyclist in Gaza who's now an amputee, having been shot in the leg by an Israeli sniper at a protest. It's, you know, so the religious element often gets overstated. Uh, you know, there are a lot of people who just have the right to and just want freedom of movement in, in you know, the state of Palestine, in a, in a, in a sort of binational state of Israel, Palestine, whatever it might be. Yeah, I mean, and I want to come back to, to a lot of what you just said there, and, and particularly the relationship between the bicycle and Palestine and Israel. But you had a challenge early on just getting in. <laughs> I mean, you said you're, you're part Turkish, and I, I imagine 
that that might have been part of the reason. But I love the fact that because you were sort of pretty much anticipating that you might be held um, and questions in, in immigration and what that would mean would be lots and lots of hours and no food. You actually had a packet of Eccles cakes, <laughs> especially at the ready, and that this is what helped you deal with this, this kind of interrogation and, and, and lack of systems. Anyway, you did get in. Um, and one of the early comments in the book is that, I uh, quote, there's something odd about finding a land so contested, so fought over, as, as you've just been telling us finding that land in the same banal and part derelict state as land the world over. So for those of us who haven't cycled in Israel and Palestine, what are these landscapes like? Are, are we in a hilly country, flat country? Is it both hilly and flat? Is it hot? Is it very hot? Um, what's it like physically in terms of traffic on the roads? I mean, just talk us through how it felt to be there on your bicycle from a physical landscape point of view. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's beautiful, you know, that relationship of, traveling on a bicycle in an open country or even in a city or in those curious like edge lands where a city becomes countryside or I think what I was talking about is sort of the banal overgrown land um, I think it was near the net near an airport which is often the case because obviously airports are somewhat out of town uh, and a lot of that sort of you know travel touring cyclists I think we're used to seeing those border areas where you get you know the duty-free shops selling cigarettes perfumes you, you know, you get the truck drivers. And, and, and by and large, there isn't a lot of that in Palestine because, uh, you know, as with the title of the book, 50 miles wide, it, it's a pretty small space. And um, yeah, so it was kind of, uh, it, it's, di it's very eclectic. You know, you can go down towards the, the Nakab desert in the south and it's, you know, this sort of rich orange sand and a blue sky. Um, and it's, you know, it's desert. Um, and to be honest, actually, in the sort of early, the earliest and the original propaganda of Zionism, you know, had this phrase of the, the land without a people for a people without a land, you know, so, and it really leaned heavily on the images of the desert. It was like, there's nothing there, which has been a very problematic part of the racism by which Palestinians and Palestinian culture has been erased. And then similar with First Nations people in Canada or in the United mm -hmm. States, you just make, make out that there is nothing there. Uh, and then, but then and, and of course the desert is very sparsely populated, but then if you go into the hills around Ramallah and Bethlehem, you have, um, you know, you have kind of a lot of farming, smallholder agriculture, you have, you know, the most wonderful olive oil, is um, is kind of made and and uh, you know you have villages and you have culture and you have communities and, and that was always the case whether you're talking about 1850 1917 1948 or, or today um, I mean and, and equally it's not really as straightforward as that I mean Palestinians and Arabs are uh, and actually in the Middle East you do find as much as there are incredible problems of corruption and political corruption you do have a, like a thriving capitalist spirit as well so you'll, um, you know, you, you have the, the places on the edge of towns where people are, you know, there are factories. Uh, the economy in Palestine is incredibly frustrated by the Israeli blockade. I mean, e even things like the, the traditional Palestinian kafir, the scarf, um, you know, there's only famously only one place, I think it's in Hebron, that makes those now in Palestine because the dyes that are used um, are uh, uh, sort of prescribed substances in case they're used in explosive devices. So, you know, that very kind of tenuous threat apparently has kind of put out of business and, you know, an entire sector of, you know, Palestinian textile workers. And likewise, and in the book, the sort of the craft brewery outside of Ramallah, they similarly have lots of problems with with export and import whether it's that a hold up, that, that might be a hold up of a shipping container at port or the um, the you know the import of the printed bottle caps coming from from France and they're, they're held at the port coming in so there's this you know this constant frustration of business and, and daily life 
Um, yeah, and the, the brewery example, I, I thought that was such a great example in the book. I mean, not least because there seems to be a worldwide connection, doesn't there, between cyclists and beer, and especially good craft beer. Um, but but just your description of that of that visit and the brewery and some of the challenges that those people were up against to run their business and to lead their normal lives really came out in that incident. And the book is full of those encounters that you have, partly because you're on the bike um, with people that really illustrates the differences in the everyday lives between the Israelis and the Palestinians and then the Palestinians who are living in Israel and then the Palestinians who are living in Palestine and et cetera, et cetera. I mean, tell us about um, the bike path in Tel Aviv just to see some of the other side of the story because I thought that was a fascinating little cameo about the guy who set up this immensely popular bike path having been told that this was impossible, people don't ride bikes in Israel. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, it's, I mean, it's a nice story. It was kind of, you know, sort of dis... I mean, it's a, it's a global story of gentr gentrification and a sort of slightly disused down at heel part of town. And then, you know, cyclists are kind of, you know, wayfinders. You want to get from A to B quickly. You don't have or need a car in a city. Um, you don't want to wait on public transport. You love riding your bike. So you find this path and uh, eventually the sort of the municipality of Tel Aviv Jaffa developed this path and then you know so you have a, a regular through fare um, and then eventually you get oh well there's a lot of cyclists coming through so we'll have a cafe and then another cafe and then suddenly you get some dog walkers and then some buskers <laughs> and then you kind of you know create uh, you create an ecosystem I mean in, in terms of well your own work with sort of biodiversity and kind of resiliency you know it is actually these spaces where you have this kind of thriving organic healthy opportunity for exchange which again there's a very good contrast because actually the the physical military architecture of the occupation prevents all of that you have nine meter high concrete walls that stop farmers reaching their fields you have military checkpoints that in that stop palestinians going for bike rides because you know you, don't, you have a 30 kilometer bike ride and you've got three military checkpoints and all it takes is one soldier who's particularly racist who wants to ruin your day and that's it and then the, the on the israeli side of things you have this um this cycle path which is kind of the spirit that kind of wouldn't have been, you know i would say in cities the world over if not the world over full stop we need to cultivate where you have this coming together of different groups of people, different types of transport, people who are walking, skateboarding, uh, cycling, whatever it may be. And then you have the opportunity for exchange. Um, so yeah, and now it's a very fashionable kind of upmarket um, drag through through this now very popular part of, of Tel Aviv. And, and yeah, that's that sort of spirit of incremental change as well, which I kind of find very valuable. And some of the site, you know, cycling campaigners are frequently the most kind of doggedly determined and also inspiring of all campaigners that I know. It's you know, <laughs> fight for every small victory and then you you edge forward gradually towards your goal which is of course you know quite an important message when you have such a protracted issue as as, as we do with palestine and, and israel um and, and then yeah as you say there was uh, like the mayor of tel aviv you know, people don't want to cycle here this is the middle east it's too hot you know people don't want to get hot and sweaty out on a bicycle and so there's that complete closed mindedness to the idea that change will come and again it's kind of a, where the bicycle is nicely disarming because obviously it's it's sort of more neutral and it's less kind of imposing to say uh, change will come people will all ride bicycles but actually that spirit of change being possible is really integral and invaluable to the sort of determination by which you know the occupation will be ended and and will we will have a solution here because it's not possible to to continue as we currently are did you find that attitude within the palestinian cycling community as well because i know i know you met some people from the palestinian cycling club didn't you and a palestinian cycling union would you say they would share that philosophy of gradual change and optimism um yes <laughs> um but also in, in, in some ways, uh, I mean, essentially Palestinians are victims of racism on a, on, a, on a great level in terms of the denial of their land, the denial of their mobility. I have, since last being there, I have Palestinian friends who were attacked out on a, a bike trail 
uh, by Israeli settlers who are essentially on illegal land, but they are charged with this, turbocharged with this Jewish nationalist racism that sees Palestinians as, um, you know, as below even second class citizens. So hmm. while Palestinians do have this same absolute love of riding a bicycle and the freedom that comes with it, and, and that's absolutely the case, um, in some respects, it, 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 I think in some respects it can be, and, and everyone wants peace and everyone wants a resolution, but I think to have optimism is sometimes uh, when you are dealing with the situation of, of being repressed, optimism is kind of a luxury in some ways. You know, it, it's, uh, there's a softness that allows you to believe in optimism. And, and don't get me wrong, many pal Palestinians are the most inspiring, resilient people I, I've ever met. But the, the simple bicycles will help us overcome this. It's is, it is, a privilege in being able to believe in something so reductive. And there were Palestinians who would have loved to go to Jerusalem to watch Shajiro d'Italia in exactly that spirit, or who, who would want to ride this land and some of them do you know credit to them they roll straight through checkpoints on their bicycles because they they benefit from this kind of israeli racism that assumes the only cyclists are israelis so there goes an israeli white riding through and and you know there's this wonderful anarchic spirit to it that you know in the spirit of, of freedom and a sort of libertarianism a, a gentle like kind-hearted libertarianism and freedom that uh, that comes with the bicycle and, and all of that is happening you know, it is there, but um, yeah, as I say, when, when you have to worry about settlers throwing rocks on you on, on your bicycle, then it's, uh, yeah, just to, of, of course the bicycle is a beautiful vehicle of escape. I think it, it takes, those of my Palestinian cycling friends, it absolutely lifts them out of some of their worries and their morose as it does us, but it's not on its own a solution. You know, we, we do need, we do need political will. You do need diplomatic pressure. Yeah. Uh, we need, probably sanctions and boycotts at this point as well um and and then you know that that will create the that will create the momentum um that that will bring change i'm sure and hugely topical at the minute hasn't i mean there's been quite a lot in our press well i say quite a lot there has been mentioned in our press at um the sort of criticism of israeli for for you know being so focused on its own success in leading the vaccination race as it were but at the same time the palestinians to my understanding have hardly had any vaccinations at all and it's very very hard for yeah. the palestinians to have access to it and that doesn't get discussed as much and that yeah. seems to be such a stark and kind of salient um, example of the sort of racist infrastructure that you were talking about earlier. Absolutely, I mean it's the definition of apartheid really, when you have one part of the population gets a vaccine, another part of the population doesn't. And I mean it's important to clarify as well that this isn't like, this isn't Palestinians waiting on Israelis to help them. Israel have dismantled Palestinian COVID clinics in the West Bank. They have um, detained Palestinian health workers in East Jerusalem, and they have stopped the import of vaccines that were procured by the Palestinian Authority into Gaza. You know, Israel is manipulating COVID to frustrate, you know, essentially to frustrate Palestinian healthcare efforts. And it's, it's, it's cynical and it's reprehensible. And at this moment, you know, a pandemic should almost by definition, much that it is heart wrenching and sad and it will take so many people too early in life. It is the opportunity by definition for, for unifying in some respects. And, and I, yeah, I think it's, again, it's this racism that's ultimate racism because it doesn't trouble to insult anyone as being an Arab or you know a Muslim or whatever it might be it actually doesn't even talk about the existence of Palestine when we say Israel is vaccinating 70 percent of the population that's because we're accepting the idea that Israel has no responsibility to the 50 percent of the pop the other 50 percent of the population that it also controls it's it's Boris Johnson saying we're not going to send vaccines to Scotland <laughs> you know um to, yeah. it's wrong to make like facile comparisons but I mean it is incomprehensible to imagine it in in yeah. any other solution in a, any other situation and at the risk of getting overly political here and I, I do want to bring us back to the cycling but I, one of the things that's just been really troubling me a lot lately is how difficult it is or how difficult it has been become 
to criticize the behavior of the state of Israel, for example, in relation to the vaccinations, without being accused of being anti-Semitic. And I think it's, yeah, it's it's become really dangerous politically in the UK, at least, to to try to say, look, actually Israel's out of order here because you instantly become branded as anti-Semitic. And that just closes down the conversation in a way that I think is really dangerous and really worrying and, and a disaster for the Palestinian people. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's a disaster for the Palestinian people, but it's also a disaster for all of us. Actually, to be yeah, honest, yeah. Uh, Palestinian advocates for Palestine are often sort of most familiar with the, the issue of kind of infringements on free speech, because there is a very successful, very well organized um, Israel foreign policy lobby to, to shut down criticism as quickly as possible. And you know, you sort of come first for the Palestinian activists and then, you know, but now we see, you know, other issues of university free speech, you know, can, can you critique this, can you critique that? And yeah, we, we live in a very ironic and dangerous time where there's such a, a, a sense that oh, you can't talk about anything now. And um, yeah, yeah. Like, typically it's actually, a, it's people already in positions of, of power and, and authority essentially just demanding the right to say the British Empire was wonderful, to, to say that, you know, Palestinians made their own problems for themselves. And it, it's kind of a very, uh, it's a very weak ideology that, that presents itself as if, as if hard talk kind of thing. Yeah. But, you know, essentially democracy rests on, on free speech. It r rests on people saying something. And I mean, we see it within the UK. Again, the pandemic is a good illustration of things because you need um, a, a genuine marketplace of ideas where people can sort of confront power, can confront authority to talk about corruption, to talk about things like the system isn't working. You know, I mean, democracy rests on people saying the system isn't working uh, or this isn't working. And that's how you get the right answers and the right outcomes, whether it's delivering on justice for Palestinians or whether it's getting your vaccine. Well, the vaccine for rollout in the UK has gone well, but the, the, the test and trace have been the most farcical, expensive disaster on earth. OK, uh, let's not go there. Let's not go there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> We're going to ban all mention of Boris in, in the rest of this book or anything associated with him. Um, tell us, in the context of, of free speech, I mean, this is a challenge for Israeli people as well, right? I mean, I. I know many Israeli uh, people who are horrified at the way their state behaves in relation to Palestine and the Palestinians. Tell us about some of the conversations you had with Israeli people, I mean, ranging from the settlers to the pro-Palestinians, because that must have been so interesting to hear their perspective, what the compassionate version and the less compassionate version. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, I stayed with a, a guy in, in Tel Aviv who, I mean, uh, touring cyclists will be well aware of uh, the, the community, warm showers. Um, you know, I got onto warm showers because I thought it'd be great to meet some uh, cyclists in, in Israel. Stayed with a wonderful man, um, Mikhail, who, who, you know, teaches um, at a kind of kibbutz-like uh, kibbutz -like place down in, in the desert in the south to mixed classes of Israeli, Palestinian, uh, non-Palestinian Arabs from say Jordan or, or Egypt. Um, and, you know, massive, a, a great guy with a massive heart. Um, and, and cycling is a big part of that for him as well. I think it's, you know, it's, I think the bicycle is often the thing, um, it kind of keeps your soul safe a little bit. So it's kind of the thing that sort of gives him his resilience. And, you know, here's a guy that, Again, you know, Israel sort of restricts uh, travel permits to Palestinians. So maybe Palestinians who do live within um, within actual Israeli territory who might go back to the West Bank to help with the the harvest at uh, the olive harvest at harvest time makes it hard. So there, there are labor shortages back at the farm. And, you know, Mikhail would have been someone who had gone to the farm in Palestine to work with the Palestinians bringing in the harvest kind of thing. So, you know, there are these like really inspiring and, and human efforts, whether it's around the, the cycling community or farming community. I mean, food is often something that, I mean, has become really contentious in, in the area because people want to say, you know, who does hummus belong to, um, <laughs> which is really a, a much, it, I think who hummus belongs to would be seen as much less important if everyone just had equal rights. I think if everyone had equal rights, there wouldn't be so much controversy around who owns hummus. 
Um, but yeah, I think this is one of those things where, I mean, increasingly, and especially under the Netanyahu government, which is also frighteningly corrupt, you do have lots of activists, uh, pacifists, people who want to live side by side with their Palestinian neighbors within Israel. And every, every bit as much as the sort of the external discourse in the West is failing the Palestinian population, they're also failing the Israeli population who's saying, no, this isn't natural, this isn't healthy. We don't want to live mm -hmm. in this kind of authoritarian existence as the oppressor because it's not emotionally healthy. It's not naturally healthy. It doesn't, you know, whether it's living near Gaza and fearing that, that, you know, you don't want a flare up of tensions after Israel attacks Gaza and Gaza fires some rockets back. This is the situation isn't in anyone's best interests, Palestinian or Israeli. Um, and the silencing around that point um, internationally in the UK and the US doesn't, is not a good thing yeah. for the average Israeli citizen. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I think it's just so important to, you know, to, to really drive that point home, I think. Yeah. I think you're wrong about the hummus, by the way. I, when I was in South America, there was a huge, huge battle about whether Pisco Sours, the most amazing drink ever, is Chilean or Peruvian. And those are, those are two pretty equal countries, actually. And <laughs> that battle was still absolutely ferocious. And anyway, we won't go into the details. There. I thought you were actually about to say that the hummus war had continued into, the, into Latin America, because there is actually a massive Palestinian population in Chile. As I say, lots of refugees from Palestine uh, have eventually left the region and yeah so there is kind of a Palestinian population in Santiago and stuff like that. And there probably is a, a hummus war there too. Absolutely. I have a couple of questions for you from the question box uh, from Justin Shields what might be able to what could we do to help the plight of the Palestinians and then Ian Lidlam I have refused to consider visiting Israel and the West Bank because of Israel's racism towards Palestinians and right-wing policies. I don't want to visit because it would be a small way of supporting the Israeli state. Is that a good reason not to travel to Israel? So what can we do to help the Palestinians and should we actually be boycotting Israel in your view? Yeah, I mean, um, I think boycott is a, is, a, is a tricky one. I mean, by and large, I, I think absolutely we need a boycott, just as we had a boycott of apartheid South Africa and sports and musicians were a big part of leading that boycott, saying what is happening here is inhuman uh, and we shouldn't endorse it with our cultural product or with the beauty of sport, with the sort of, you know, the notion of sport as a community, because let's get the community first and then let's go back with the sport. At the same time, I mean, obviously I went into Palestine, into Israel, and I'd like to believe that the, the book of stories that I recorded was worth that journey and it got, it to some extent helped get the message out. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, you know, equally, the, the Israelis have banned uh, the director of the Israeli director of Human Rights Watch has had his visa revoked and things like that. And that's a guy that I think really should be in the area, in the region. Mm -hmm. So I, I think I do think, yes, there should generally be support for the idea of a boycott. And I mean, in particular, you know, things like uh, the Israeli state really doesn't like the European Union, which is which has been very good at. Uh, labeling products such as you know spinach or avocado and maybe avocado but spinach for sure and other products that are grown in illegal settlements to, you know to give consumers back in the UK or in the EU the right to, to, to choose what they're buying um, and so yeah I think not buying things from illegal settlements is, is a good is a good thing I mean I, as I say, I think boycott is valuable. I also think solidarity with Palestinians is as valuable. Um, and, you know, there are great organisations as one brilliant, I think the first ever community interest co-op uh, in, in the UK, Zaytun, which is, it means olive, but uh, is, is they sell olive oil and uh, herbs. It was one of the first ones set up in the UK, but they work with small farmers in Palestine um selling olive oil um in the uk you can buy it in sainsbury's you can buy it on the website it's a fantastic success story and really supports livelihoods in palestine so that's one good way um there's a uk organization called big ride for palestine and they will do a sort of annual ride to raise awareness 
I mean, their, their fundraising that they were doing this year was to help build um, playground equipment in, in Gaza. Um, and they're generally sort of very good at sort of pushing a, awareness of uh, the Palestinian cycling community as well. So yeah, big ride for Palestine, they're good guys. Um, and yeah, I mean, I think, you know, there is a value just to not being silenced on these subjects. And it is not to say that we need to be antagonistic, that we should be antagonistic. But I think there is a kind of, uh, you know, a plain spokenness. You know, there's this notion that racism is, racism was problematic, but we can't talk about Palestine. It's, it doesn't work like that. You know, racism was about human rights and, and these things are universal. And yeah, there is a kind of, for it, often there's a desire to not talk about the issue um, and that essentially as I say it doesn't help anyone and, and as I you know whether your primary sort of um, solidarity is with Palestinians or you know for, for people who maybe have a, an affinity to Israel and have family in Israel I mean increasingly sort of not even just left-wing Israelis but people who are quite centrist and just believing in the rule of law really want change in their country because the you know the the religious nationalism of Netanyahu is really dangerous for everybody so, yeah yeah cool sorry I'm just distracted by the we've got loads and loads of great questions and I've got millions and millions of <laughs> millions of questions I'm going to ask you one more of my questions before we go back to to other people's questions because I'm I'm really fascinated by something you said earlier and I'd like to come back to it just on the topic of adventure and and what it means to have an adventure and how what did you describe it as kind of white macho male ish our notion of adventure can be sometimes and you you write in the book that um when we when we westerners take an adventure we step into the open book of where i'll sleep each night that thing that westerners have the luxury to call adventure but is really only the voluntary dabbling in a hardship which so much of the world's population lives each day it always begins the same way a basic formula known to unknown abundance to less i, I love that quote i think it really tells something about adventure but I wanted to link it as well with some really interesting tensions that I think come through the book about your relationship to being where you were on the bike. Because on the one hand, it allows you to immerse yourself and engage and you have these compassionate con conversations with everyone from the Palestinian beer brewers to the young lads at the checkpoints with their big guns who you describe as just as trapped as the Palestinians, in fact. But on the other hand, you say, well, I can just get on my bike and cycle away. So you're both there and you're also free to leave. Um, and that seems to fit with this musing about adventure. You know, you can choose to take on this hardship as a Westerner, but you can also choose to whack out the emergency credit card and get out of the situation. So just, just tell us your thoughts about that and how you would develop that critique of adventure and how it felt to you being there with that yeah. freedom to leave. Yeah, I mean, it's a privilege for sure, this, the mobility that we take for granted and in some ways lockdown and the pandemic has given Westerners, I mean, it's so funny, the world banning British people from entering their countries, so we're 200 years too late perhaps in some ways, but it's, it's a bit of a, this worrying about travel restrictions is, as you know, as I say, it's how most of the world kind of lives their, their life as, as a matter of course. Um, but yeah, I think it is a tension with adventure and I mean as you say I, I think uh, actually the adventure plus is a really nice uh nice turn of phrase for it you know there's another organization adventure uncovered um that has a similar kind of ethos yeah, yeah. there's um a new adventure travel company called much better adventures which actually you know not only does a lot of you know carbon offsetting associated with its travel which you know you can take it or leave it i think it probably does do some good but also the the kind of communities that they're supporting in their, their host countries are, are often kind of engaged with the environmental movement and obviously environmental justice and social justice kind of um you know has such a strong overlap which i think is becoming ever more realized you know that you, you are you can't be wealthy or rich if you are living in a polluted or depleted ecosystem. And then, and then similarly, whether it's the micro adventure movement and adventures closer to home, I think there is ever more a desire for, for this kind of travel, for any travel to mean something. Um, 
and also the reasons why we're traveling. You know, we're talking ever more about work-life balance, about mental health. Uh, and, and actually, in many ways, travel has been used, and I'd say abused to an extent, by the kind of, you know, neoliberal capitalist systems the last, certainly the last 20, 30 years. Sort of really working people to the bone. And then, you know, you, you have a blow off and you go hiking in the Annapurna for like two weeks and then hopefully you're better again and you can like prolong your nervous <laughs> breakdown by another five years, perhaps. And, and I don't think people really want to live like that. And, and equally, I think it's, I don't want to sort of judge travel because actually so many of the most enriching experiences of my life were obviously out on a bicycle in, in other cultures in other countries. And there is transformative potential in that. So I think it's a question of, you know, not throwing the baby out of the bathwater sort of thing. And I think it's healthy. I think it's very healthy that there's an ever more a movement to be, um, you know, to travel responsibly. I, I should have mentioned it a moment ago, but Amos Trust is another really good organization who organized bike tours in, in Palestine. Um, and, you know, that sort of Christi Christian pacifist movement um, and big Palestinian Christian communities. So, you know, they, you go there and you, you stay in the villages, you see the, the beauty of, of the landscape and it, it's kind of transformative travel, and it, which is what travel has the potential to be. Mm. And uh, yeah, modern society has a tendency to industrialize almost everything and industrialized travel, like industrialized food or whatever it may be, is, is often not satisfying. Yeah. So just to come back to the practicalities, there's a whole load of questions about your route and yeah, how, how to do this. You might want to take a pencil and pen because I'm going to blast you with five of them, I think. Yeah. Is, there, is there a ferry from Italy or Greece to Israel? Have you been inspired by Derek Murphy? That's obviously a key question, who hasn't? What was your route and why did you choose it? How did customs treat your bike? Um, yeah, how did you come up with your route? What's the best airport to arrive at any formal bike routes? And most important question of all, did you have good falafel in Bethlehem? <laughs> um, I'll, I'll try and do as many as, as I can. <laughs> yeah, so, ba so basically talk us through some of the practicalities. Are there good bicycling routes? How would you how would you go about doing this if you wanted to cycle in Israel and Palestine? Yeah, I mean, you do have Where's to fly Bethlehem? in. Yeah, you, you have to fly in. Uh, you fly into Ben Gurion, which is just outside Tel Aviv. Um, there have previously been airports in Gaza, and I think maybe in the, in the West Bank, but Palestinians aren't presently allowed airports. Um, so you have to fly in. Uh, there aren't, yeah, no ferry links, unfortunately. But I mean, you know, this is, it, it's really nice to like ask these sort of questions, which are simple questions of how do I get there? And, and again, it sort of speaks to this sort of eternal universal desire for mobility that, you know, I, I always have faith in the cycling tourists, the, the touring cyclists to get there first kind of thing. Um, so yeah, no ferries at the moment. Um, falafel and hummus is fantastic <laughs> almost everywhere. I mean, not wanting to be kind of at all nationalist about anything, but in general, uh, the sort of, Arab Israeli populations, especially a city like Haifa, which has a big Arab Palestinian population, hummus is fantastic. And then again, as touring cyclists will often attest, it's kind of the very unsuspecting roadside um, restaurant where it's just one sort of plastic patio table out front with a tablecloth on it and it looks entirely kind of uh, run in the mill. And that's where the guy sort of produces the most fantastic bowl of hummus with olive oil and parsley over the top of it and, um, you know, a plate of pickles to go with it. So it's kind of, it's, it's universally pretty good. It's kind of more of a challenge to find bad hummus, um, I think. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I'm, I'm now trying to remember some other ones. What, how did I choose my route? It was pretty fluid, really. I mean, I, I cycled in, in Palestine, Israel, a couple of times. Uh, first one, first journey was pretty much more simple, really. Flew in again around Tel Aviv, um, went to Jerusalem, cycled in the vicinity of Jerusalem, Ramallah. And then, yeah, the final trip was very much... Um, the main journey was kind of wanting to see a breadth of the country. I mean, I've always loved cycling in deserts. I love mm. shooting stars, like the emptiness, like mm. the darkness of the night, um, the quiet. 
Um, so I did want to go all the way through to the desert and cycle all the way down to sort of Jordan, uh, just beyond sort of Wadi Rum. Um, and, and I wanted to go up to Golan, which is sort of Israeli occupied Syria. And, and actually to speak to an earlier question about the weather, you go up to Golan and in the winter it can be bitterly cold and you have these beautiful old mountains. Um, and so that it was kind of sort of following these impulses a bit, but wanting to, to take in as much as possible kind of thing was a big part of how the route got formed. You did some wild camping in the desert, didn't you? I loved your kind of mathematical logic of why it's safe to camp in the desert on your own. <laughs> do, you want, do you want to share your the, the maths of wild camping and why it's a really good idea? Because I thought that was just brilliant. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think it's based on my principle that people are good people. I guess I would accept the idea that some people are not good people, but the likelihood that the, the person who finds me in this middle of nowhere is also that very small minority that I would accept is a bad person who might wish me harm is very small. Um, and then even in that moment, I kind of feel you as someone that's, I mean, I just call it camping, but I guess wild camping is now the, is now the term, but as someone who's wild camping, you know that you are there as a body in the desert uh, with your bicycle underneath the stars. And whoever's walking around is not expecting to find you there. You know, you have a higher expectation of being found than the person who might find you. <laughs> yeah. find yeah. Somebody. So, uh, yeah, it was kind of, it's, it's a sort of muse within the book on the probability of, you know, what, you know, what might go wrong. But uh, again, I, and as with most touring cyclists, I think we have had universally wonderful sort of heartwarming encounters that, I mean, beyond even bothering to say, outweigh the negative ones. And, and yet at the same time, we're all human. I mean, very sadly, we live in a media ecosystem that's very negative. And even the stuff that doesn't, the news that purports to be the truth. Mm -hmm. You also have, uh, you know, whether it's true crime or action movies, uh, we take in so much that affirms a very negative of humans and human nature yeah and it's hard to sort of rise the bicycle is a great way of bringing you into into contact with the actual world and with actual actual people which is, is why it's so sort of enriching and optimistic i find um but yeah and then after a few days of sleeping out under the stars you get back into the swing of it and you realize that no one really means any harm to anyone <laughs> yeah no i absolutely endorse that and i i think all of us do don't we that if done this cycling stuff and encountered that positive side of humanity I, i'm aware that we're down to our last five minutes i don't quite know how that's happened but i do believe we're supposed to finish at six so i wanted to, to end by talking about your next project but before that one of the most powerful lines in this book i think is where you say you you can't silence a story and i love that you know you can't silence a story at the end of the day did you think this story is a hopeful one the one that you've told in 50 miles wide and what did you hear from the people you met about their hope for the way forward and their and their idea of the solutions in maybe two and a half minutes? Yeah, um, I mean, I think it, it is hopeful. It has to be. Um, and I think, uh, yeah, the spirit of the bicycle is, is universal. And I think that spirit of uh, riding a bicycle, I mean, there's quite a lot of music in the book as well. There's musicians talking about um, you know, performance and playing. And I do think that feeling, of whether it's sweating up a hill and then feeling happy when you look at the view, whether it's descending a hill or whether it's uh, the perfection of a note of music, you know, the, all of these things that are kind of essentially sort of articles of beauty in this world. I think there's something in the human spirit that is always going to demand the right to enjoy those beauties mm. as a free person. Mm. And that is the source of essentially my optimism. And I think the optimism of uh, the famed optimism and resilience of the Palestinian community. Mm. Um, and, you know, it's not, it's not as simple as that. It's, you know, Martin Luther King and the moral arc of the universe bends towards justice. You know, people do have to push to make it bend. Um, but where people do push, you know, it gives, because then we can live, you know, a better life for all of us on a better world, you know, and what could be better than that? <laughs>
What a what fantastic way to start to draw to a close. Thank you so much, Julian. But we can't let you go without you telling us what's next for you. I mean, we started with talking about the huge shifts in both your cycling and your writing between life cycles and 50 miles wide. What, what's next? Where are you going next? Yeah, I mean, I um, between the lockdowns last year, I was uh, I, I bought an old bike in Lisbon and I rode it to Barcelona. Um, it was very socially distant. It was just me and my bivy bag in the middle of Andalusia, I promise. Um, and yeah, you know, it was it wasn't writing about the pandemic in any way, but this kind of this feeling that I've always had of traveling on a bicycle where you're a, a bystander on the world, if you like. Um, something about that which I always love and is always beautiful was heightened again by the pandemic and you know the encounters of whether it's the baker who just gives you a baguette because he uh, it, this is a Spanish baker despite the fact that he had a baguette because um, uh, he loves what you're doing um, or you know people who you know the, the restaurant owner who I think undercharged me for my wonderful plate of like bread and tom tomato with uh, with olive oil drizzling all over it uh, uh, you know and whether it's even some i remember watching a, a waiter outside a restaurant wiping down the menus you know with this disinfecting of all surfaces and i kind of think on a very essential level a lot of the precautions that we have taken and, and spain probably better than the uk in many places a kind of evidence of this innate care that we as humans have for one another Mm. Um, and, you know, I do think that's there and it's important to sort of try and rise to that and to, yeah, to expect a, a, a world that reflects as much. And, and yeah, there was, there was, as I say, this, this heightening of uh, watching the world at this time uh, with the roads very quiet and just cycling through it on an old bicycle. Um, so, yeah, I, I've got a, a short, short, shortish book in that, I think, which is mostly written and I'm talking to my publisher about it at the moment. Um, but yeah, so that, that will probably be the next project for now. And then there's always the next one after that. <laughs> <laughs> well, but this new one sounds like a fantastic thing that we've all got to look forward to. Julian, thank you so much for being with us. It's been a real privilege, as always, to talk to you. A big thanks to everybody in the audience that's also joined us. Um, I can see from the chat box that, Julian, you've been really hugely appreciated, your, your eloquence and your erudition on this topic and your passion for the politics of this region. Thank you again. Thank you to everyone who's joined us. I'm so sorry if we haven't got to your questions, but there were a lot of them, as you would expect, with such an interesting topic. And of course, a massive thank you to Laura Mon and to Tim Moss for making all of this possible and for giving us these so welcome little insights and flashes of other parts of the world, which is probably what we need most in this time of lockdown. So thank you so much, Laura and Tim. Thank you, everyone. Um, let's keep talking um, in our various forums. Um, meanwhile, see you soon. May the tailwind always be at your back. Take care. Goodbye.